So again, disclaimer, nothing is a stock advice. Use it for your do-it investing purpose and use it to speed up your research purposes. So uh, uh, Sudarshan chemical, if we look, basically it's into uh, you know pigment and there are different kinds of pigments. Pigments are something which adds color uh, and which is used to you know provide that uh, color. And it is used in paint industry, in coatings. It is used in plastic industry to bring those colors, uh, in ink, in cosmetics. And uh, we have already understood a little, little bit about it when we did a detailed study on ultramarine pigments. And there are multiple types of pigments, multiple varieties of pigment. So many times two companies can be in the same pigment space, but still they could be providing different pigment, like a blue pigment could be different from a yellow one. And still they may not be competing because there could be two different products. So Sudarshan is there in the pigment and in pigment, uh, they are present in both organic as well as inorganic pigment. But the focus is more around organic pigment. And this is the higher growth area uh, because of you know the product being organic. Uh, organic compounds and uh, azo, uh, azo pigment is one of their high focus area and they are present in these four industries coatings plus so all your Asian paints burger paints and all uh, they become a customer then your typical plastic companies like supreme industries and all those kind of companies can be you know target customer and then inks and cosmetics cosmetics uh, relatively it is smaller for uh, Sudarshan but these three are major segment and it's not only a domestic player, but it's also a global player with a very significant global leadership in market share. Uh, so Sudarshan has both, call, they call, uh, and uh, it's good that management itself calls out part of their business as commodity rather than, you know, just calling everything specialty. They say that part of the business is commodity and then there is a specialty side. So they're present in both the segments. And worldwide, uh, you know, it's almost uh, now uh, the market size opportunity is almost somewhere around six to eight billion. And this industry globally grows around three to six percent. Yeah, eight global eight point six billion market size opportunity. It's growing around four to six percent. Then we'll see why we are interested in this company when the industry grows globally only at four to six percent. But uh, uh, why I am interested in Sudarshan? So, uh, you know, for trading, we have momentum portfolio, quants portfolio, but a lot of my discretionary investing happens on the value side and value mostly happens in headwinds. And if we are studying something that doesn't mean, you know, we are hundred percent invested. It's more about finding the idea, doing the homework and being prepared and maybe take a small position and when the momentum is right and when the tailwinds come, then you scale up the opportunity. Or you know that this may not be a good idea to invest, like uh, the amount of, uh, you know, uh, optimism I had on Jubilant before doing the detailed study, my optimism reduced. I mean, business-wise, price-wise, everything is okay. Uh, but seeing the execution, that optimism reduced a bit. So that is the purpose. So same way like I studied Apollo, uh, I could, we could see that there is a headwind in the industry. Uh, the numbers are reflecting, the price is reflecting. Uh, we know on social media with discuss. And uh, that is where, you know, all the quotes we use a lot, but when it comes to real investing, when it comes to real analysis, we may not follow it. So that is the reason I'm using a lot of these quotes to highlight. I'm not doing anything new or anything illogical. It's just that just practicing what some of the great investors have taught about. And uh, the pessimism is visible when you see the results. So again, all of you who are practitioner member, by this time, you should be aware of our uh, stock analysis tool, which is integrated with Screener. And this is a quarterly seasonality and trend view, which comes out of that. And you can see you have almost three years of data. And what you can see is 2022, whether it's your operating profit or PBT or PAT, these are at three year low. These numbers are worse than 2020 and 2021, which highlights the kind of pain which is there in the results. So why are we interested? If you look at why so it's reflected in margin, the company which once used to operate on a 9.3% margin, last quarter it did a 0.1% margin. So the question is, is it structural? Is it cyclical? 
what is the reality, what has happened, why it has happened, what can happen. Now the general sentiment will be everybody writes off companies when you know the price sets the narratives. But on one side, we say that Asian paints deserves 80x and 90x and this and that. And then we say that this industry will continue to perform, but somebody who is a supplier to that industry, the narrative is there to be same. So I if it is a structural issue, then it should arise from the whole ecosystem. It can't happen just with pigment. If it is a structural issue, then somehow it should happen to paints also, given paint is a significant consumer of pigments. So I just want to set some and you know some anti-points against the common, you know, pessimistic consensus. And history is always important. And I will show you how uh, many times people say that it's all about future, but you learn from history and the best of the investors, they have learned from history. The whole data science works on history. My whole investing thesis has happened on history and there's so much to learn. And I will show you how there's so much to learn in Sudarshan. I have gone and collected 17 years of data just to highlight that how patterns and history repeats. So first thing, whenever we invest, we talk about there should be a good management and how do we define good? So managements who are honest, managements who are good capital allocators and management who have a good execution history. So if we look at Sudarshan's management's execution history, this is how they have grown in last 10, 11 years. The revenue multiplied three times, EBITDA multiplied three times, EPS multiplied three times and asset has gone up almost 3.5 to four times. 10 years, 3x, not a bad thing. <coughs> and not great, but 11% double digit growth. Also, when we see how was Sudarshan 10 years back versus now? Earlier, it was into pigment, it was into agrochemical, it was into master batch. Now, they have sold some of these business and they have tried to be pure play pigment focused company. Earlier, globally, they were in top 20. They were around 18th or 19th. Now, globally, they are the third largest pigment company. I'm not talking about third largest Indian. This is across the world, third largest company. And see the jump from 20 to third. So you can imagine they would have grown much higher than the market. And that is why I said the market might grow at four to 6%, but still I'm interested in this company, which means they grew at much higher rate than the industry. <clears throat> the domestic market share has gone from 30% to 35%. Uh, from being a pure play, India R&D player, they have now R&D labs even in Europe. And now they have focus on high performance pigments where, you know, some of these products are not typical commodity product in nature. And also energy is a major cost. So they're trying to, you know, uh, get into more and more renewable energy sources and that sources increase. So this tells something about the history, something about the credibility of the management execution track record. So the important thing is, okay, track record is good, but then business is all about future and we can see 0.1% margin. So what is the issue? And is it a, if the issues are structural, we need to stay away from companies because many times, you know, cigar butt and what looks value, it remains value on paper. It never creates wealth. So, you know, falling in the trap of looking cheap is something which is very common. Like if you take a paper industry, it's a structural downtrend industry because of the emergence of uh, digital media. So we need to see what is happening to pigment industry. Is it a structural downtrend or is it a cyclic downtrend? And to answer this, let us look what has happened in the history. Uh, what is happening today? Is it happening for the first time or has it happened earlier also? Here you have data from 2006 for this company till 2023, correct. I have the gross margin, EBITDA margin, EBIT margin, PBT numbers and something on the asset side. I'll go a little slow on this side. There's a lot of data and a lot of insights to consume. First thing, you observe what is the minimum and what is the maximum number in each of these rows. If you see gross margin, the highest gross margin was 47%. 
the lowest gross margin has been 41%. In fact, now 39% is the lifetime lowest gross margin. But it went through a lower gross margin multiple times. 44% to 41%, 41% to 47%, 47% to 41%, 40%, 40% to 42%, 42% to 40%, 40% to 43%, 39%. Now come to EBITDA margin. Let's come to PAT margin. It used to be a low margin business, 2.6. Despite of highest gross margin, the PAT margin was very low. That means the impact would have come mainly from your interest and depreciation and your, uh, you know, other, all the core expenses. But in these days, it used to operate at a low margin. But from there, it suffered the worst when gross margin reduced 1.1% margin. From 1.1% margin, this company went to 7% PAT margin. From 7% PAT margin, went to 2.5%. From 2.5%, went to almost 6.8%. Uh, then almost 8.5%. And now it is at 2.5%, which is almost the second lowest apart from this year. But here, the it used to be a lower margin business and still it is almost at the same margin. So cyclic lowest margin due to raw material pressure. Cycle came in favor with peak margin. The other thing is look at EBITDA to interest. So what is EBITDA to interest? If I am generating 100 rupee of EBITDA. So only from the EBITDA you pay your interest. The next item is interest. Let's say if your interest is 50 rupee and you are generating 100 rupee of EBITDA and let's say your business is stagnant, then max you can cover two years of interest cost, which is not a great scenario. If your interest cost is more than 100, that means basically you are going to default on your interest payment. And if your interest is 10 rupee, that means 10 years of interest. You have very good cushion. So your balance sheet is strong. Look at these times, the EBITDA to interest. It was 4 and when the cycle turned negative, it came to 2.7 at the worst. Again, when the cycle improved, it came to 7.7. .7. Again, worst cycle went to 2.5. Again, went to 7. And despite of all these bad things happening, still it is 6.6. .6 and even with the current three quarter, it is still... <laughs> Decent four times, three, four times above, which is a comfortable. I am okay uh, putting money on companies above 2.5 EBITDA uh, in general. And when they're at cyclic low, maybe I will go below two if I am sure. The other thing you should notice is fixed asset turnover. So if a company has 100 rupee of net fixed asset and generating 500 rupee of profit, the asset turnover is five times. And the more they churn their asset, the more revenue, the more chances of profit. These times, the stock company used to do five times asset turnover. In this cycle, it went from 6 to 2.7. Question is why? And then from 2.7, it went to 4. And then again, it has gone down to 2.5. It can happen because of two reasons. Either they are generating lesser revenue or their assets have increased and they are not contributing. <coughs> so there is a concept called operating leverage and a lot of my value investments happen out of operating leverage where your margins are depressed for a reason and when the triggers come, the margins reverse. And one of the reason, possible reasons for operating leverage happens is massive capex. When companies do massive capex, they take a lot of, uh, do a lot of capex, they take a loan. So the interest cost increases, the depreciation increases, they need to set up plans. So they need employees, they need salespeople. So they hire a lot of people who are not going to contribute maybe for six months, one year. But then when the revenue start contributing, you get the additional revenue coming. And then the employees become productive, your expenses are contributing, your interest starts reducing, your depreciation starts reducing, or all of a sudden you see a huge impact. So question is, did Sudarshan went through any kind of massive capex here and here? And maybe that is the reason. So just imagine, what if it can go from 2.5 back to 4 times, what will happen? So just think about all these things. So cyclic lowest margin due to raw material pressure, cycle in favor with peak margin, peak asset term, best financial ratios. Demand, actually, I will tell you what had happened. 
demand went out of favor and at this time the company did a huge capex and the balance sheet was little stretched and hence all the financial ratios and rosi went from 32% to 11% but then in one to two years demand came back because aaj ab log tents ko leke itne bullish hai to 10 years back they must be bullish so when the demand came back and the massive capex started performing the 2.7 asset turnover became 4 3.3 and your rosi became this and your interest paying capability increased and then cycle in favor with better margin better asset turnover improved balance sheet and healthy financial ratios currently what is happening it is going through what has happened in 2013 or 2008 it is at the lowest margin of lifetime due to demand pressure what is happening in europe because of raw material pressure because of what is happening in the supply chain disruption because of huge capex we will talk more about it and lowest asset turn and hence finally screwed financial ratios so the question is how next 3 4 years will can pan out from here and what is the margin of safety and what is the risk so i explained you everything but i'm giving you proofs by going into 2012 13 annual reports you know extracting everything this is how the management commented in the annual report in 2013 when i read it looked like as if i am reading a 2023 annual report exactly same situation overall the business sentiment during uh, the year under review remained extremely challenging on account of steep rise in input prices coupled with a slow down in demand exactly this is what has happened right now and also delay in commissioning capabilities installed as a part of ongoing capex Three things happened that time: demand contraction, raw material increase, massive capex. Same three things happening right now: demand contraction, raw material price rise, massive capex. The global business recessionary condition, same recession, but same in Europe, America. So there's no signs of a major recovery impacting exports as well as realization. A direct fallout of this on the company was major buildup in inventory, and the same issues happening right now. Interest costs also had same thing happening right now. Just a replica of what is happening right now. Profit were on tremendous pressure on this, 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 this on going capex, and you can see in 2012-13, your profit margins have come down from seven percent. No, I am sorry, it was used. It it was not a low margin business at that time. the same cyclicality actually has played out but the balance sheet was little more stretched compared to now that is what i mean when i say it was a relatively weaker business see what happened in 2013 14 this is a commentary of management in 2013 the other thing is you saw the execution history we also need to see the management commentary are they very aggressive do they give fake hopes or are they realistic so you saw how they commented in 12 13 now this is what came just within a year i mean the annual report would have got published in july august and then next year the year 2013 14 is expected to be another challenging okay so they are giving outlook for next year the year 2013 14 is expected to be another challenging year and sometimes it could be copy paste also but i have seen every 3 year they change little bit of tone and pigments are on look out for alternative suppliers to meet very requirement and that is how they are telling we are preparing because uh, you know uh, developed nations have their own cost challenges and that is where we come with uh, you know india based advantage <clears throat> and this is what happened in 13 14 where it turned out actually a good year and company recorded 29% profit growth 32% growth in pigment division so you have a history that you know everybody was so gloomish and exactly same scenario and actually next year things were very different and when the promoters they themselves can't predict like i there won't be any promoter who will try to give a very sad picture when the next year is going to be rosy if it is going to be sad they might give a rosy picture but if it is going to be rosy they will not give a sad picture that highlights what will happen one year two year down the line sometimes even managements they don't know so we have to look at the broader number broader picture if businesses are non linear everybody knows it will grow at 6% but whether it will grow every year which year it will grow which year it will not grow that nobody knows because all these aggregation and market sizing estimates they work in long term 
but they don't work every year in a linear manner. Now let's look at the financials more. So basically, if you see current margins, they're hugely depressed. This is the current TTM EBITDA margin. Uh, you will not see in your Excel template, I have made certain changes. So again, I have made some announcements that uh, we are giving up grade of this tool. There are a few more functionalities I have added. So I will do a separate one hour session. Uh, but now we have a TTM comparison because in these kind of situation, when your uh, current TTM margin is very different from previous year margin, it's very difficult to compare. So I want to give this flavor of a real TTM comparison and you can see how bad it is. But when you see a three-year history, five-year history, eight-year history, rolling history, the mean margins have always been around 7%. Currently in these four quarters, it is 2.5%. So if you give, that is why we say, I mean, uh, I've done certain tweets. When you look at the Infosys return for last 24 years, only four years that has given negative return. 20 years it has given positive return, which is almost 80% uh, of the time. But when you see Infosys results on a monthly basis, <coughs> you will see only 60% of the months have given positive return. When you see on a daily basis, maybe only 50% of the days. So the longer you stay in investing in good companies, the lesser is your volatility. So this is a three-year, five-year, eight-year track record. And this is the volatility of last four quarters, just to highlight. So that if you give more time to a company, what can happen? How cash flows they have generated and how those cash flows have been used. So if you see in last eight years, almost 2,400 crore of cash flows uses, 50% has gone into CapEx, which is a good thing. 11% of growth is coming, but this is a CapEx driven business. It's not a, and you see the peak at around 27, 28% return in capital, the bottom around 6 to 9% return in capital. So, Mota Moti average, if you take the asset over life, it will be a 16, 70% return in capital business, which is higher than your cost of capital, decent. I like, I am okay with businesses above, you know, 15% uh, return on capital. 12 is my limit. Below that, I don't try to go. So, that is good. Uh, asset heavy, but uh, okay, moderate, decent return on capital. Working capital wise, this business is decent. I mean, if you see the working capital utilization is hardly 10%, which I like. And uh, they have never been super, uh, you know, debt uh, heavy company. Uh, and they have carried debt. Most of the debt is working capital debt and all, which they carry. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is debt on the book, which keeps on carrying and growing. And the debt is comfortable from 13 the debt equity ratio EBITDA you have seen it kept on improving so decent business 50 percent grows you know goes into capex and that is how the company grows if you look any history almost same but recently if you see out of 1300 in last three years 900 has gone into capex almost 80 percent of this and still these are the numbers so actually the company has done a massive 750 thousand crore capex i will talk more about it this is the balance sheet quality and see these are three year rolling number again uh, go to the webinar video and see uh, where I have explained all these charts this is a rolling three year I have explained why I take rolling three years you know just to avoid all these quarterly noise debt equity debt equity wise you will always feel it is high but that is why I don't use debt equity I use interest coverage a bit to interest you know those kind of metric which tells the balance sheet comfort and that has always kept on increasing Cash flows, 70% uh, is my benchmark. The company is almost there, 68-74% more or less. And this is the rolling cash flow from operation, almost 200 crore of cash flow the company generates. And free cash flow goes negative because new huge capex has happened. 900 crore of capex has happened in last, you know, three, four years. So that is the reason the free cash flow is negative. Now I am reiterating the current numbers are worst. So Mr. Buffett says, do not take yearly results too seriously. Instead, focus on four to five year averages. I realize many things which I do quants and say, actually, you know, uh, the great of the investors, they do the same thing. They don't do anything different or I am not doing, basically, I am not doing anything different and some, I'm similar uh, to them. And we get crazy about quarterly results and Eastling don't even look at yearly results. 
So when you look at all these numbers of Sudarshan, I hope you will appreciate what is the importance of the statement made by Mr. Buffett. And if you look at the business, 2013, 14, 14, 15, 15, 16, there was no single year when the business didn't have headwinds. They were always sub headwind. Uh, sometimes it was Europe issue. Sometimes it was China meltdown. Sometimes it was too much supply from China on the commodity side of business. And see, where do you find companies who say that China is dumping products and our business is getting impacted? They highlight all the things. So I found the management very honest. There was only one place where I felt that are they trying to hide something? And I was like, oh my God, I need to answer this. I find the answer to this question. And luckily one of the analysts exactly what happened, I went through five years of con calls and the answers were different in one year versus other versus other. And somebody went and asked in that con call over the last two years, your numbers have changed. And then they gave a reason that, okay, that number was when I said that number is this, I mean this, 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 this. So I, I will discuss more about it. But always you had some headwinds. But despite of that, revenue growth 3x, cash flow growth 4x. 6x better EBITDA to interest and the stock has given a 1200% return and despite of falling by 50% from current last high. So if we can forget last 10 months and look at last 10 years, it may be worth to know more about the business. So if we look at the business, the whole market of pigment globally is at 10 billion. The segments in which they are present, which is their you know opportunity size is 8.6 billion. And the global pigment market is anticipated to grow over 3% because US, Europe grow at 3%. Uh, Asian countries grow higher, but their share is not that great. So net net 3%, which is not great. They are not present in a, basically they can grow only by snatching market share. That is one thing. And that is why they have grown at 11%. So don't have a high kind of very high growth kind of hopes from this company. And now they're at 2200 crore revenue. Uh, this is a 22 number, third largest. We have gone through this. Uh, only focused on pigment. Uh, kept selling the non-core businesses. Cost competitive. That is how they have gained market share from uh, you know global companies. Uh, I will talk more about global companies. Who are the companies and all what is happening there separately. Uh, okay. And they have kept on launching 2025 new products and that is how they do it. Uh, pigments are the largest raw material for paint. So if you can be bullish on paints and coatings, you can't be so bearish on pigments. And India, the growth number is 12% and basically their export and domestic is 50-50. So at least 50% of business, the average growth is 12%. Rest 50% average growth is 3-4%. That is where they need to snatch market share and they need to grow. And these are the things in organic, in organic and these are some of their products. Now, if you look about the management, so already you have seen the management, how they have executed the execution quality. They have, you have seen the uh, financial quality of the business. Of course, the business is cyclic, but when you look over long term, you know, it works. And you have seen the kind of returns they have delivered, the thing they have done. Uh, if we look more into business and chemical, pharma, these are very technical businesses. And basically, these are businesses where my observation is it is technocrats with good capital allocation skill who succeed and the one who are honest they create wealth for their shareholders so if we look at this management uh, it's rati family and both are ms in uh, you know btech or ms in chemical engineering from best of the universities so basically they are core technocrats and technocrat management who are focused on core business so we know Focus, focus, focus. That is what Mr. Warren Buffett says. Uh, you know, and they are technocrats and they have a hunger for growth. Like when the industry has grown globally at 3%, uh, they have been able to grow higher and they have come from 18th rank to 3rd rank. And if you go through the previous annual reports, they had a target. So six, seven years back, they had a target of being the fourth global company. And why fourth global? Because size, if you see the number one and number two company, they are very, very big in size. It's very difficult to just give me one second. From 18th rank, they decided. So number one, number two were like eight times bigger. So they can't be. So those were realistic goals to be four. And they have shifted from 18 to four. And so far, no hanky panky. I mean, all the related party transactions, most of the things are more or less look okay. So management also looks decent. 
Now, the most important question uh, currently, how attractive it is, what are the risk, what to expect? So, how to value the business? And I will talk about few valuation metrics which nobody has ever discussed. But this is how I try, I try to get into the current business condition and see how I can value the worst case scenario. So, I will use few very interesting metrics for valuation which I haven't seen anybody using at least in my investing journey. But if we look at some of the typical metric, like we did in insurance, we came up with a very, very operational kind of metric. These are the historical numbers. I want to discard any valuation metric related to EPS because a cyclic business, you cannot measure at the extreme cyclicity with EPS because that 1% PAT margin is useless. Sometimes it goes 7, 8%. Sometimes it comes 1%. You can't take a 1% margin. So that is why I'm a, you know, I crib a lot about all this PE use and all. PE is useful only in 20, 25% of the companies and people don't know and despite of telling repeatedly. So all this metric is useless for me given the current nature of cyclicity. I will better go with the market. I have found market sales related valuation thousand times better than EPS based valuation in many cases because and especially in the last five, six years, the kind of, you know, business, uh, you know, the uncertainties which have come and the kind of short term impact they have created on EPS. Many times I find a sales based valuation better than using EPS. So if you go by all the sales, whether it's EV to sales, market cap to sales or a book value, you can see that with respect to history, there's a huge uh, margin of safety available. Whatever metric you take, almost a 25 to 33 percent margin of safety, which is available at these valuations. Before we get into more about the valuation, I just want to highlight right now uh, what are the things which are happening because it will help in valuation. So they are number three company and there's a consolidation happening where the top two companies, they have sold their businesses. So the biggest of the companies in global pigment are exiting. There's a pressure on the cost we discussed. There is a focus of company on ESG. Their priorities for FY23 commercialization of new capex and generate cash flows from this investment. Focus on controlling cost. Almost 750 crore of capex has gone in advanced stage of implementation. Container slowly, I can sense from Q3 con calls these issues are easing. And one reason why the company was on back foot. They had a cost advantage selling in Europe from India, but when your container cost went over the roof, basically they were not able to, they were finding it difficult to compete with the local European companies. So at least that part of issue is already solved. If you track all the, you know, Baltic index and, you know, all the container cost, that part of issue is getting resolved now. And there is an advantage which they got is because of the energy crisis in Europe where European companies were finding very difficult to cope up with the energy prices, but they had an advantage. So Europe was a mixed market for them. Uh, of course, demand headwind was there and uh, expense side. On one side, it was the container shortage, but that was getting balanced by at least in India. Even in India, then if you look at absolute basis, it's a bad thing because the energy price is shot up. But if you look on a relative basis compared to the European peers, it was a you know better thing. And this is how the capex has happened: seven fifty crore of capex. So just imagine the kind of massive capex which are which has you know gone here. And let me just show you on screener. So if you look at the balance sheet, basically in two thousand nineteen they were on a four sixty four crore five crore net asset. Right now they are at thousand crore and within next six months, there will be 1,200 crore. This is a 2.5x jump. And you have seen your peak asset turn was almost, uh, you know, five, six. Let's say even if they can do a 2.5x or three, you know, three X on a 1,200 crore, they can do somewhere around 3,200 crore to 3,600 crore or turnover. Right now they're at 2,200 crore. You know now the mean margin. I'm giving you all these numbers because you have to do all these numbers, estimate, put the numbers and then see how much of margin of safety is there in the valuation. 
and some of these capex bulk of this capex is going on the non commodity side and they accept that commodity side will always be a challenge and china will always do the dumping so bulk of the capex they are trying to do either it's a de bottlenecking or it's a brownfield or it's more around a little higher business organic business uh, you know those kind of thing so see they are also telling when you do all the history so you have to go and validate with data what management and this is see forget sudarshan this is how uh, you should analyze any business and that is why when you see, when i see a lot of stock discussion happens and when i ask tell in numbers i don't see lot of effort and my sincere request to you before you ask ye stock dekha hai wo stock dekha hai go and first do it yourself do these numbers put those numbers that is where the real discussion happens just discussing ye stock wo stock doesn't won't mean anything so with this kind of capex 3500 crore i showed you with numbers 1200 crore historical is you know more than 5 asset but history is not possible because that time the land was cheaper so you know uh, there is a concept of incremental uh, roci 10 saal pehle ka roci may not be possible because you can't buy machines at those cheaper price you can't buy land at those cheaper price so even if you take a you know 3x still you get that 3600 crore and that is how it has been derived and right now the demand is sluggish so the question is when that demand will change there are certain products where demand is there the yellow pigment which we have launched is seeing very good demand so not everything is bad there are certain things which might do well and some of the things have been done for abita some of the things have been done for backward integration and all of that uh, but that is not playing out again because of energy price on absolute basis my sense is even this whole thing my sense is in one year it should stabilize and i'm tracking cement sector and energy is one of the key expense item and the theory is you know markets are always smart before the energy coal prices fall flat the coal india or you know the similar kind of charts will you know have that kind of view the kind of uh, momentum we had in those kind of charts and prices i see at least it is subsiding so my and i think today i was reading somewhere regarding the coal prices the prices have actually gone down so all that is if all that happens it will you know further improve so that 0.1% margin and see even they are at 0.1% margin and they have gathered huge market share in 10 years by being lowest cost player just imagine what will be the situation of the global peers your number one is so why the global companies are selling their company they are selling their pigment business so if they go at break even the other companies go in losses and that is where good companies companies which have some kind of advantage they survive and they become stronger and they grab more market share now very very important chart again i will spend lot of time here like i spent on that 17 year history the 17 year history is back so there i explained you the business cyclicity here i will explain you the valuation with business cyclicity and we all love multi baggers but multi baggers are made when you buy things dirt cheap so either you be a momentum investor or you buy things dirt cheap and wait for 3 4 years for the cycle to play and make money every approach is a good approach we have to be sure about about our own research and conviction and all of that so right now the company is at a better scale and better balance sheet why better scale because in 2013 they were at 700 crore revenue so 3x they have done in 11 years so the scale is 3x then now so better scale why better balance sheet better balance sheet because that time when they had the same demand headwind same raw material headwind same major capex their ebitda to interest was 2.5 now this is february 2023 data it is still 6.6 despite of all that bad result and see again pnl is accounting cash flow is real cash so if you are having huge depreciation that is coming because of this 800 crore of capex which has happened which is not contributing that capex is accounting so it's not like company has met 0.1% margin the actual cash margin is much higher many people fail to understand these basic things same thing happened in apollo many of these stocks i have played the same thing and i keep playing the same thing so better scale better balance sheet we are 30% higher from 2014 valuations and approaching 2016 now let me explain each of these one second <laughs> the gray area chart is the price 
the gray area chart, this is the price of last 17 years. The blue area chart is the fact. So you can see the price went almost, actually it went 800. Uh, it would have become so smaller that I wanted to show it. But see, in 2013, the stock was 2006, 17 rupee ka stock, 11 may 68 rupee, 13 may corrected from 68 rupee to 31 rupee. Now the cycle played and became a 3x, but it became actually a 12x. It rested a little bit here for two years. So 3x here with one year rest and then another five year move. And again, our 20% correct, so I think the cycle is over, So, and learn from history. And then a correction from this to this and then 800, 700 something and then now 360. Look at the cyclicity in PAT. Your PAT went from some 50 crore to, you know, 35 crore. And then 35 crore pad went to 120 crore and then again came down and then again peaked and then again it has come down. See, this is the cyclicity of pad. 10 crore pad became 4 crore, 5 crore and then again 40 crore. Again from 48 crore to 34, 22 crore and from 20. The other big mistake people do in these companies, they invest at the peak of cycle. Peak growth, peak margin, peak valuation. That is the worst time to invest. So why the why they will use they will not lose 50% of money. So the first skill itself is to identify a cyclic business. And when I say cyclic, a company could be cyclic because of four or five reasons. And if a company is cyclic because of all four reasons, that's a super cyclic business. So all that analysis is required, and that can be done only through history. So again, when the cycle turned, they went from 22 to 70. And then 70 to 145 and from 145, they're back to 57. Of course, COVID is a unique scenario and all of that. It's not massive, nahi hota, but given, you know, everything has backfired, it has gone to this. But the cash profit is still better. See, this is the cash flow. Still, they are generating 80 crore of cash flow. Okay, so this is the key thing. Now, look at the valuation metric. I have used a metric called net fixed asset plus current work in progress divided by EV because my basic premise is it's cyclic. Everything will come back to normal and the assets which are not yet contributing, which are taking the margin down, they will become productive and then the real valuation will come. And then whatever debt they have taken for the asset, everything is captured in the enterprise value. So if I find if today to buy this company, I am paying 100 rupee of enterprise value what is the hard asset I'm getting, hard net fixed asset post depreciation I'm getting so that if tomorrow this business is sold, I, how much money I can get? If I have a hundred rupee worth net fixed asset and I'm paying a hundred rupee of enterprise value, basically kuch nahi chala ho, to main usko bech ke asset bech ke paisa recover kar lunga. That is the kind of metric I have taken. So basically, if you see in best of time there in 10, it used to trade at 3.7. See the scale was smaller. The balance sheet was relatively weaker and as companies become bigger, they demonstrate better performance and cycle come. So last cycle 3.7, this cycle 7.2, the whole 2018 bubble burst. But at worst of cycle, it was at 8.1.8 .8 times of enterprise value. So uh, there is a little mistake. This is, <coughs> this is. EV divided by net fixed asset to CWIP. So if you have 100 rupee of asset, basically you are valuing the company at 180 rupee in terms of enterprise value. And in 2008, it was 7.2. Right now it is at 3.1. Okay. And in this whole cycle from 2016, this is like the lowest. So this is not as juicy valuation as this scenario, but you can't compare the balance sheet and the scale of 2013. Uh, that time survival was little difficult with 2.7 kind of EBITDA to interest today. It is much more comfortable. So market also rewards proportionally. So I don't expect a 12 bagger to be created, but I will be little surprised if I don't get a 3x in next four years here. That is how I see it. When it will come, I don't know. I don't even know that how long this, you know, pressure will be, but this is where we stand and we'll use more all this, which we are learning. We'll use more in valuation. So if we do a DCF, so first we went by the 
ratios. Then we went by the specific metric history. Now let's do the DCF. DCF is all about assumption. So mean and median PAT margin has been between 5 to 6% with 8.5% as peak and 2.5% as worst annual margin. I'm not talking about TTM, annual. Annual, I mean, quarter-wise, even it has shown 0.9%. Average fixed asset turnover has been 3.3 .3 with range extremes from 2.5 to 3.9 in best 10 years. Average sales and PAT growth has been 9 to 11%, but with non-linear behavior. So DCF is not forecasting. This is an analysis to know how far we are from margin of safety, how big or small is the margin of safety. So if I do a DCF with same 9 to 11, 10% kind of revenue growth, it may not come in year one or year two. The idea is just to gaze. And I go to the average 5 to 6% PAT margin business because this is the average and the scale is bigger, so they are, might be executing better and they're getting into more non com all the capex which is there, that is in the non commodity side. So I hope with all of this, at least they will be able to realize the average PAT margin. So I have taken the average and then the PAT to cash flow conversion ratio with all of this and how much of free cash flow will be generated, assuming, uh, you know, uh, given this capex itself will take care of. So I will give you an Excel where all the formulas have been built. But the idea is basically you have been taken care for 3600 crore of revenue. So till you reach 3600 crore of revenue, you don't need huge capex. So that is why 40, 40, 40. Why 40? Because this is the maintenance capex. Again, substantiated through the data. All of this needs a lot of analysis. Each and every assumption needs a lot of analysis, validation. And then you can see it shoots up from 40 crore to 150 crore. So, you know, all these numbers, there's a lot of hard work behind it. It's not put out of thin air because your current 900 crore capex will work till here. And then again, you need to put it and hence it balloons up. So net net, this is how you get your free cash flows. When you put all this free cash flows, this is the kind of discount you get. A DC valuation, I'm getting around 473. The current discount is 23%. If you give an exit multiple of 15 to the business from the current price, it's 13%. I think it's a decent valuation. Uh, I think those who are buying value, even if I buy a 2% allocation, I see good money to be met. But still, I have not added because I am more data guy, macro market, everything. So I'm still holding around 0 0.6, 0 0.7%. Uh, let's see how things change. Now, what can go wrong? So first, company has grown higher than the market, but the demand is non-linear. India growth is like high single digit, 9-12%. Uh, our domestic, okay. So you can see there is a lot of non-linearity in demand. And see, four-year revenue, when you see a four-year revenue CAGR, that also you can see, uh, it is cyclic. 14-15% it topped out. And then the worst was 5%. Then again increasing. Then again, it has topped out. Three year revenue and the more you go in shorter time frame, the higher are your deviations from 28% to 2%. So the longer you go, the more you will be closer to the mean. That is what I am trying to highlight. So when you give time to the businesses, they will perform more as per expectation. So forget about all this two, three, four quarters of no supply side. So the two global companies, one is Clariant and another is BS BSF. So basically both BSF and Clariant, they're big chemical companies and both of them, they have sold their pigment business. And US, Europe, Japan. So that is where they're gaining market share being in India and doing. The deal recently, it happened in 2021 when the sector was its in prime. You can see the kind of margins they made in 2021. Uh, 2021. They did a 8.5, 7.6% margin. It was one of the best time for the sector. And in the best time of the sector, the deal happened around 11x EBITDA. Okay. And in worst of the time, still Sudarshan, your margins are down. Still it is available at 12x EBITDA and it is gaining market share. So this tells something about the valuation attractiveness. If we look at the global deals. But it also highlights the risk, the kind of pain industry is going through. Uh, this is one risk which has not, actually all the risks have triggered. 
your supply chain risk has triggered, your raw material risk has triggered, your capex is wrong time has triggered, your demand has triggered. So this is the only risk which has not triggered, which is the REACH certification. I mean, compliance wise, still everything is fine. Uh, dollar volatility is another risk which could happen uh, because the export import thing, because they get 50% revenue from, you know, uh, from export, uh, then, you know, all these things. So yeah, accept compliance. <laughs>